Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thanks for joining me this morning. We're in the Gospel of John, right at the beginning of chapter 19, but we're actually going to back up today into another gospel to make sure you've got the whole story. Grab a good cup of coffee and your Bible, and let's open up, first of all, to John 18, where we ended up yesterday, because in this case, we've already had Pilate offer Jesus for release. But the crowd wants a guy named Barabbas instead. We talked a little bit about who he was and what's going on. One of the things we did miss that you probably are aware of from another gospel is something John didn't want to get into, so he doesn't bring it into his narrative. And the fact that Pilate tried yet another way to get out of condemning Jesus. When he found out he was a Galilean, the gospel of Luke tells us he sent him to Herod Antipas. And in doing so, in Luke chapter 23, verse 8, it says that he sent him to Herod because Herod was in Jerusalem at that time. Of course he was. He's at least in name a Jew, and he's there to celebrate the Passover. It says in verse 8 that Herod was very glad to see Jesus. For a long time, he'd wanted to see him because he had heard about him, was hoping to see some miracle performed by him. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus didn't answer him. And the chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt, mocked him, dressed him up in bright clothing, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Previously, they had been enemies. So this has taken place, and Jesus now back before Pilate, finds himself once again offered to be released, released as tradition was during the Passover. What takes place, perhaps I think shocked Pilate once again with the idea that they would want this insurrectionist Barabbas released instead of Jesus. So what does Pilate do? Well, all together he has decided at this point that this man doesn't deserve death, so Let's see if we can at least do something to encourage the crowd to release him. And Pilate decides on a flogging, a beating. In chapter 19, verse 1, it says Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. In that one sentence, that one verse, we don't really get all the details about what's going on here. But it says that they, in beating Jesus, also mocked him. Some of the mockery that followed from Herod's house came right over to Pilate's court. It says in verse 2, the soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and clothed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And were slapping his face. Now, the fact that they don't cover this beating in great detail doesn't change what took place. Now, in some older depictions of this beating, we almost ignored it, almost treated it like, you know, uh, an overzealous parent spanking a child. We didn't get into the real facts of what this was like. It wasn't probably until the movie The Passion of the Christ came out that folks realized exactly how bad this could be. Now, that particular movie may have overstated and overplayed that flogging, that beating, But it was terrible nonetheless. And what's interesting is Pilate just thinks he is trying to get the crowd's sympathy by perhaps showing what happens when uh, you, you dare to stand up against Roman law. And he's going to give this man a good beating and therefore encourage the people to change their minds, to say, no, let's let him go. He's suffered enough. That apparently is the strategy of Pilate at this point. What he doesn't realize is he is fulfilling prophetic scripture. And I'm going to jump one more time, this time all the way back to Isaiah in the Old Testament, because there we're going to find some verses that indicate that the suffering servant, the prophesied Messiah, would also have to suffer in the way that Jesus has now suffered with this beating. And when I say it's a beating, keep in mind that the Roman cat of nine tails was a tremendous weapon of torture. A soldier was to stand by and watch the beating to make sure that it would be stopped if the individual could not deal with the intended 40 lashes. Because in that Roman cat of nine tails in the leather um, 
tied within it would be pieces of bone and metal so that when the flagrum was brought down over and over across the back of the victim, it would cause deep bruises and lacerations and the blood would begin to flow. There were incidents recorded of that flagrum flying around the face of an individual and perhaps ripping out eyeballs and teeth. It was a very wicked element that was involved in Roman punishment that's not described in detail by John or any of the other gospel writers. But yet, what did the Old Testament tell us? Well, in Isaiah chapter 50, it says of the Messiah, listen to these words, I gave my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spitting. So this is being fulfilled in what we're seeing happen to Jesus just today. If we go on over into Isaiah 53, you'll remember it says in verse 5, he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we were healed by his wounds, many of them. Well, some think, oh, but that's talking about the wounds of the cross. No, the wounds are starting right now with this particular beating that will leave the back of Jesus Christ ripped open, skin hanging in shreds, massive bleeding and bruising. As one doctor put it, Jesus was at this point, after the beating, already in critical condition before he was asked to carry his cross to the place of execution. So at this point, as Pilate brings Jesus back before the crowd in verse 4, it says he went outside again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. And then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Here is the man. From the old King James, I like, Behold the man. This is Pilate's way of trying to say, okay, I'm going to give him a good beating and release him to you. But guess what? The crowd was going to have none of that. They've already been paid off. They've already been told what to say. <laughs> that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Things haven't changed much through history. And at this point, Jesus, not saying a word, like a lamb before his shearers was silent, the scripture says, stands there willing to take the punishment for our sin. It's a picture of the Messiah none of us should ever forget. We'll get more into this in tomorrow as we look into the details of the cross. Our loving Savior, ready to give his life for us. Folks, if that doesn't move you to serve him and love him, I really don't know what will. Well, God bless you. I'll see you again right here tomorrow as we wake up in God's word.